No. <laughs> No, I only have my regular ones. <laughs> I didn't want to by mistake. <laughs> All right, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started, give a couple minutes for everybody to get in here from uh, outside. I want to welcome you to the second annual uh, CISO Security Awareness Forum. Unfortunately, last year the government decided to shut down in October, so we didn't have our second annual uh, forum last year. Um, so this year is our second, um, and I'm really excited. We have a lot of uh, good events and activities and uh, briefings this morning. Um, so President Obama has designated October as a National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And cybersecurity is a shared responsibility and everyone must play an, a role and a very important role um, as well. As technologies advance and the number of interconnected devices uh, continue to increase, so does our need to understand cyber threats and how to defend against them. Personal healthcare information and organizational intellectual property, as well as medical billing and payment organizations, are increasingly at risk for data theft and fraud because of these attacks and, and breaches. Information is a protected, highly regulated mission critical resource here at CMS, which if compromised daily operations can grind to a halt and serious consequences will quickly follow. The shift to a more mobile health care delivery system designed to lower costs and improve patient care positions positions cybersecurity as a crucial business consideration rather than a risk assessment afterthought. Healthcare leaders must recognize the current cyber threat landscape. This landscape is constantly changing. The escalation of healthcare cyber threats could create severe patient safety issues, business disruption, and associated reputational damage. Healthcare leaders must mobilize and take the necessary actions to prepare and safeguard their organizations. Our goal here today is to educate CMS personnel on how to protect their personnel their personal information as well as protect CMS information and information 
and, inf and information from cyber attacks. I would like to uh, introduce Dave Nelson, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer and Chief Information Officer to kick off this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And good morning and, and welcome um, to the second annual uh, get together. Um, I think uh, all of you uh, understand uh, healthcare, protecting healthcare data <clears throat> is, is more than just health records uh, to CMS. I mean, it's PII, which is, which is a, a huge amount of responsibility we have. It's, um, in, in cases now, it's FTI, financial transaction information from, from IRS. Um, and it is personal health information. So there's, there's a huge um, accountability to all of us to, to really look after that data. It's, it's a really important mission. Um, Teresa kind of set some context talking about the world we're in today. Um, it's, a, it's a real world. Um, every day we see something new in the, in the press, something about Target, Neiman Marcus, Home Depot, you guys are all familiar with this, J.P. Morgan Chase, and maybe even healthcare.gov you've heard of. Um, every one of those uh, has had some malicious attack on it recently. There's been millions of records stolen from some of those external um, uh, organizations that I talked about. Luckily, healthcare.gov, by the way, there was no PII compromise there, so um, what you read in the press is accurate. Um, but it is really important. Um, it, it, it kind of brings to light just how important this is for all of us and, and how accountable we are to the, um, to the public and to the, to the citizens. So we do take it serious, um, and, I, and I, I take it very, very serious. Security is, is one of the most important parts of, of my job as, as a CIO. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments over the last six months to a year. Um, we've made a lot of progress here within CMS with our, with our security. Um, ATOs, for example. Um, when I, when I uh, assumed this role as CIO <clears throat> about six months ago, um, we were at a really, really poor um, uh, actually metric for ATOs. It was nearly 30% of our systems out there um, were operating without an ATO. Um, working with, sorry, yeah, working with uh, EISG, Teresa, and all of her team, we really put a focus on this, um, spent a lot of time with the business owners that uh, had some of these systems out there that, that had been operating with with ATOs that had expired or those that had actually stood up systems without ATOs. And I'm happy to report, I'm pleased to report, we had that down to 8% at this point. So um, that's much better. Um, I'd love to see something even much smaller than that. So we're gonna continue to uh, focus that way so that it, uh, it never gets to the point where uh, we're uncomfortable that we have systems out there that aren't being tested and aren't, are not uh, basically FISMA compliant. Um, vulnerability management, uh, we use uh, the ISG group uses IP360. I think all of you are familiar with that by now. We're scanning um, pretty much all of our systems. Um, I think that's an extremely uh, important piece of our security as well, is, is these scans. I know um, as you first stand up a system, that can be troublesome. There's a lot of things that it points out. You try to figure out what's false positives, what isn't false positives, but it's important. Um, I can tell you on healthcare.gov now, we're getting scanned by just about everybody. I think I'm concerned that we'll have a denial of service attack based on our scanning um, from um, from ourselves, from the department, from uh, Homeland Security. So um, we have a lot of scanning going on at this point, but it's, it's important. Um, it's an important piece of what we do. Um, the risk scorecards, uh, they're assessing the ATOs and, and the POANM 
uh, mitigation activities, trying to make sure that we have the vulnerability management scores. Those are tools that we're trying to use to help you understand sort of where your, your systems are uh, at, this, at any given point. Um, and then FedRAMP, I'd like to say a few words about FedRAMP. Um, with, uh, with healthcare.gov again, uh, we, you probably realize we, we actually moved this new marketplace 2.0, which is the front end of, of healthcare.gov for putting together um, applications in a much more streamlined um, method. It's, it's being launched or has just been launched over the last uh, couple of months, um, and it's actually out there 100% of new consumers coming to the marketplace have an opportunity to go to this new piece of, um, of healthcare.gov and get a streamlined application. It's a much, much quicker. That's being um, uh, actually managed out of uh, uh, Amazon Web Services. So it, it really is a truly uh, cloud service that's based in, in one of those FedRAMP facilities. And AWS, yes, indeed, is FedRAMP um, approved. We're also um, working through, with the department, through the department, in attempting to get the um, Verizon Terramark facility, which is uh, where the core pieces of, of um, healthcare.gov are, are managed. Um, we're on track at this point to um, have a certification, FedRAMP certification, if they pass, um, prior to the open enrollment period um, in November of this year. So. Um, more to come on this, but I, I really encourage you to look at these as, as options to where your application should be run. Um, we learned a lot through the process, particularly with AWS, on how to do this. Um, FedRAMP uh, is, is a pretty um, rigorous um, certification process, but it doesn't cover all of those platform and infrastructure controls that we at CMS need to make sure are, are, are managed. So one of the lessons learned is that let us know in, in advance uh, if you plan to use one of these facilities and uh, Teresa and her team will work with you to figure out where those gaps are and what needs to be um, tested as well. So, um, but I, I do highly recommend that. Um, we are fully behind the, the um, um, service in the cloud, cloud first um, um, way forward. Um, incident response uh, training exercises. Learned a lot from these. Um, we, are, we are currently doing these on a weekly basis at, um, within the healthcare.gov uh, environment right now. Um, but I encourage you to think through how do you do incident response training exercises on your own systems, and I'm sure many of you are. I'm, I'm, I'm positive of that. I'd like to hear more about them, actually, what, what else is being done out there. Um, since a few of the incidents that we've run down at, at um, healthcare.gov, we actually now have integrated um, uh, exercises and scenarios that, that reach beyond um, you know, even one optive within CMS, across the optives, uh, up to the department, all the way to DHS, and even beyond uh, in some of our um, uh, training exercises. So there's a lot of participation, there's a lot of importance, a lot of focus on, on incident response, making sure we know how to do it, how to do it quickly, um, and, and what, everybody, what, what everybody's role is. Um, pen testing, uh, again, uh, I'm sure many of you are doing that on your systems um, and working with EISG, we have services to do that as well. But pen testing is another important piece, so um, it, it is something that, is, that has helped us identify vulnerabilities um, within some of our systems that needed to be addressed um, very quickly. And they were, um, some of these, I'd, I'd much rather find something through a pen test, a vulnerability, treat it like an incident response, um, than actually find something that's been compromised and try to work through it that way. It's, it's, it's a, lot, a lot easier to do it the, uh, the way through our pen testing. Um, so let me see if I've, I think I covered some of this stuff already. 
Um, one of the things that, uh, again, I, I want to bring us back to the ATOs, our FISMA inventory. Um, you, there was some direction that was uh, that came down from the department, um, from Bill Core, and and went out again through our through our agency to ask you to look for um, CMS systems that should be added to the inventory. Anything that you're aware of, we want to make sure that we're we're getting those all into our inventory so that we can manage them and control them uh, consistently across the agency. Um, I want to make sure that uh, you're trusting and verifying <laughs> um, uh, how your systems are, are operating out there. You guys are, you guys are ISSOs, many of you, um, business owners. Um, you've got to take responsibility for this. This isn't just about putting things into contracts and making sure that a contractor um, is responsible for that. This is, this is our responsibility from, from CMS. So take it seriously, um, please, and, and make sure that you're looking at it from all levels. You, you can't slack on configuration management, vulnerability management, asset management, they're all very important pieces of, of our security for our systems. And it, you can't rely just on a contractor and contractor language and then just basically turn around and tell a contractor that you, know, you, you, uh, you know, didn't do the right things. It's, it's up to us to do that. Um, so let me see if I've missed anything else. Um, I think, I think I've covered what I wanted to cover here today. I really um, appreciate the work that all the ISSOs in the, or in the organization and the agency do. I actually was an ISSO myself for, for many years. I know how important it is. It's much more important now um, uh, as we become more and more of a target, um, not just at hc.gov but we're actually a target out there, as I'm sure you're reading as, as well as I am because you're in this business. Um, we have a lot of, of, um, of enemies out there, malicious characters that are, that are really targeting both healthcare and privacy information, and um, you guys are what stands um, between you know, uh, a, a real problem and um, really appreciate the work that you're doing. So. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to echo Dave's, um, you know, uh, appreciation for the ISSOs and the business owners. We do rely heavily on our contractor um, support for a lot of our systems here at CMS, but it's really the key positions are the ISSOs and the business owners that make things happen and ensure that um, our systems are secure. So next I would like to introduce our next uh, speakers, uh, social media security concerns, and they're from the Department of State. Rob Clark is the program manager for the State Department's Information System Security line of business. His background includes analysis, management, and implementation of assorted technology eff efforts throughout the government, particularly in aviation, communication, and IT. Rob Clark is a former naval aviator in the U.S. Marine Corps and is a certified program management professional, has his MBA and, and a graduate of the Citadel. Tim Dye is an IA ISS LOB instructor at the Information Assurance Branch within the Security Engineering and Computer Security Training Division at the Diplomatic Training Center in Dunloring, Virginia. So I'd like to introduce our next briefing. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Rob Clark of the two of us. Um, and as I'm not mic'd up, I guess I'm kind of tethered to the podium here. Good morning. How are you? Come on, guys. Good morning. It's not Monday anymore. Come on. Uh, you're probably wondering why is State Department doing a presentation on cybersecurity? Well, let me give you a, the Reader's Digest version of the history behind it. State Department's actually been doing cybersecurity training in its various titles since 1998. We're not the new kids on the block. In 2002, when the government came out with the e-government act, it said if somebody's invented a great program in one particular department, it's not a good idea to reinvent it somewhere else. So when it comes to cybersecurity training, we like to think of ourselves as being one of the founders, if you will. 
when DHS was stood up in 2002, within their charter, cybersecurity is actually an element within it. Rather than create their own program, when you talk to the folks at DHS and you go into the NICE initiative and you go into the NICS portal, which is through their website, and you get down to the different courses that are being offered, it's actually us folks over at DA, uh, Diplomatic Security that provide a lot of that training. Uh, we've been in this business a while and we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished. Uh, we've got a booth outside there. I'd be happy to talk to any of you about the specific courses that we have. Uh, in particular, we've got our online learning program, which is uh, using Adobe Connect. Different classes are anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes long, and they're at no cost. That always gets everybody's attention in a very positive way. We've also got our role-based training to uh, comply with all the FISMA requirements. And as a rhetorical question for the crowd, do you know what your FISMA scores were? Normally about half the audience ducks their head in shame when I ask that question. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, that's enough for me. Let me introduce Tim Dye. He's one of our senior instructors who handles both our role-based training as well as our cybersecurity online learning. And his endeavors today will deal with social media and the dangers associated with that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rob. Uh, let me go ahead and apologize to the camera guy before I start because I'm one of those that like to walk everywhere. Uh, before we get started, I like to get to know a little bit more about the people I'm talking to. Since my talk today is on social media concerns, how many people have social networking systems they use on a regular basis? Facebook, Twitter, photo sharing? Anybody got a YouTube channel where you post neighbors about your neighbor, waiting, uh, videos about your neighbors waiting for the Darwin Award? Any of that? Okay. All right, so we got a bunch of you. How many people have been here at CMS, uh, let's say more than five years? 10 years? 15 years. Ah, my candidate right there, sir. I'm just going to come down and get to know you a little better if I could. So, can I ask your name? Eric Jones. Eric Jones. Got a microphone? Oh, Kim's bringing a microphone. Okay. So, Eric, I just kind of singled you out because you hit the, you were the last hand standing. Uh, thanks. Um, can you tell me a little about yourself, what you do here at CMS, and what's important at CMS? Well, I'm actually a contractor, but I've okay. been working for the CISO's office uh, since 1999. Oh, wow, uh, CISO. So, so you're, you're all about security. I'm all about security. Wrote a lot of the policies and standards that CMS uses. Great. Um, you know, been through, I don't know how many different CISOs um, and different programs that got uh, instigated here at uh, CMS. Well, that's so, cool. That's what we try to do. Seen at, a lot. That's what we try to do at State is, is security. Mm -hmm. and approach it from a security standpoint. We work with our CISO quite, quite a bit as well. Um, so like I said, I try to learn more about CMS. So I did a lot of research yesterday. You guys have got this e-health program coming up. Is that something you guys participate in here? Is that out of this agency or this, this offices? E-health, bringing all that data together? You're probably an integral, integral part of that, aren't you? Oh, Security-wise? Mainly for standards and, and uh, minimum compliance stuff. Uh, we work with CMS, we're not integrated with the privacy team, so there's a separate team that works strictly the privacy side. Okay, okay. So protecting the data, right? The PII, right? Great. Hey, I got to get started. It's nice talking to you, Eric. Appreciate Thanks. your help. Everybody, give Eric help me. Thank you. One last question for everybody else in the audience. How many people were comfortable with that conversation? Where I took it. What were I? What was I doing? Fishing. Fishing. But when you're doing it personal, a person like this, I'm trying to get him to give me information, right? Social engineering. I established a rapport. Hit on some key things that were important to him as far as security. Things about program specific here that if I wanted to learn more about it, I could go further. The only thing I didn't do was to establish the next contact or next meeting. Let's continue, right? How many times every day, he's got his card out. <laughs> My question for you on that is, how many times every day in our personal lives with our social media are we answering those same questions to people on the internet and don't know about it? Think about that one. Think about that. So Rob's already covered a little bit about this um, on what the uh, 
Information Assurance Branch of Mission is, what we're going to accomplish and uh, do down there with our training, our role-based training, uh, our online initiatives, things that we're expanding and trying to meet the needs so that we can train more people in a more efficient way. Uh, he said we do have a booth outside. Uh, I believe the slide deck will be available, correct? If you want to copy the slide deck after this presentation. Um, we're going to look at this from a social engineering attack kind of perspective. What information are they able to harvest about you on the internet without ever contacting you, without ever establishing that first connection, right? So the consequences we're going to look at is not following those guidances and things that we know about that we practice at work for information security in our personal lives and how as a social attacker, I can aggregate information I can find on in line and form a very complete picture of you so that when I do establish that first contact, I've got a credible backstory, I've got a credible and plausible story that is going to help me gain your confidence and get the information that I seek. In this case, if I want to know more about the security of protecting the people's PII on the online services through eHealth, I would want to keep going after Eric. Eric may not be the end-all be-all, he might be a means to an end, but as a social engineer, that's what I'm looking for. Is he the answer or is he just a conduit to get me somewhere else? And how can that be done? All right, a little precautionary thing, I don't want you going back out of here and telling your CISO, Tim said do these things. I'm telling you, please be careful, don't play with any of this software on your official networks and things like that. Don't load, download any of the tools that we talk about today. Um, if you want to do some of this stuff, we're actually going to do an exercise during the presentation today. How many people brought their web-enabled mobile devices with them? Anybody? You will get a chance to do some of these exercises today as we go through uh, the event. So please be careful if you do this. Um, this is to help you understand how to watch over your own personal data. So what is social media? Well, we covered a lot of this, right? Facebook's the big one, Twitter for microblogs, we have other blog sites, we have photo sharing, we have YouTubes, we have all this different stuff that's out there. There are so many different forms of social media out there. One night my wife says, she went, I wish we could get away from Facebook, it's so overused. Well, you pull up a wiki page that lists all of the different social media outlets or social networking outlets that are out there. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these things out there that are used. Some are very small, some are very hard to use, some are by subscription only. But these just touch on some of those things. But it's a place where we go to share information about our lives so that we can be in contact and touch with our friends, our families, and our colleagues. So by its very nature, we're open and sharing with our social networking. What kind of data can pose a risk for you? That's what we're going to focus on, right? If I'm a social engineer, if I'm an attacker, what kind of data can I find out about you on the internet that will give me something to attack with that you should be concerned about, all right? And we're going to understand the concepts of data harvesting from the internet and aggregation of data. We all know the categories that make up PII but do we realize that fragments and pieces on their own which aren't enough to identify somebody positively when accumulated and aggregated together can paint a full picture that we can now have real PII that we can work with. So this aggregation of data is something that tends to get overlooked in a lot of social networking. Whoa, wrong direction. How many people know Robin Sage? Anybody friend Robin Sage? She's got a very big Facebook page. When I first did this presentation back in 2012, she had just a little under, about around 2,500 friends. I just checked again when I re revamped the presentation for today, she's up over 3,200 friends. So about 900 or so, 800 or so friends increase in two years. All right, Robin's a nice young lady. She's an MIT graduate. At the time she stood up her Facebook page, she had 
She was 24 years old, had been working in IT security for about 10 years, and graduated from MIT. She got a lot of friends requests when she stood up this page, or actually when he stood up this page. Robin Sage was a social networking experiment that was done back in the late 90s, early 2000s, to see how many people would try to friend this beautiful young lady that they seen a picture of. Robin got invites for job interviews from people in DOD and federal government. She accumulated a very large number of friends rather quickly and is still accumulating friends even three to four years after it came out that this was a social engineering security experiment. She still accumulates friends. She still has an active web, web page or, or Facebook page right now that's growing. So people sometimes think that social networking is about I've got more friends than you do. It's not. It's a good way to share your information. It's a good way to be public. I got to admit when I was a young man and had children that were, that were young, sending pictures to my parents and my wife's parents was the old 35 millimeter film days. You take a roll of film, you have to develop it, wait for them to come back, hope they were good, mail them off to the in-laws, right, after you got your copies made and wait for the snail mail to get there. Now my grandkids can call me on Skype and talk to me. And I can see pictures of them on Facebook as they're posted. I get alerts. It's a great tool when we use it carefully. So what kind of data can put you at risk? There's lots of search engines out on the internet that we're going to take a look at. We're going to focus on three of them right now today that will expose all kinds of information. This one was done by PIPL, P-I-P-L, and when we look at this, if I just searched for my name, Tim Dye, and I know that I live in West Virginia, and I can search for West Virginia as a second criteria, it comes up and starts giving me all kinds of links and information about Tim Dice. All right, we can look at the top here, possibly related results. There's 104 total results. There's 17 that are contact information. 37 are background checks. So when these, engines, these search engines go through, they pull from official background checks, criminal records, things of that nature. They also look for profiles online, and they also look for public records. Records that did not exist when I first got married 32 years ago are now online because the county that I got married in migrated their information that was in the basement of the courthouse into an online database. It's all searchable public records now. So they can crawl through that information. All right, and then they have web occurrences. If I have a web page, if I have a blog site, if I have anything on the web that I've published, these type search engines will crawl through all that stuff and find it. So if you haven't used some of these, we're gonna look at some of those. Now, I have to apologize this version of the slide deck may not have all the redacted information in it, and this next slide might reveal more than I wanted it to reveal. Yes, it does. Going to a different search engine, which is, this is a Zaba search, you can see the same search engine pulls up not only Tim Dye and three results that I narrowed in on because one of them is actually me, but every Tim Dye in West Virginia with a complete mailing address and phone number. Now I didn't ask these people to put my name, my address and phone number on the internet, but there it is. Because I've done things online where I've had to give my address and my phone number in order to complete a transaction. And all those records become searchable. Those are things that you can find on the internet. I'm going to do a little more looking. We can go to Spokio, and it goes through again, looks for Tim Dyes in West Virginia, and it starts mapping out all 47 of us. Um, all the different towns where they may live, and it finds all the previous addresses and such. If this is search engine, if you follow this through, it'll actually find all of my addresses back for seven years. And it'll go back into when I lived in towns just after getting out of the military. So these search engines will go through the internet archives, they will go through all the databases that are online and find this information about me or about you. So again, some of the stuff we have no control over. 
some of it we do. Let me talk about one more thing on Spokio. The thing about Spokio is when you go through and do a Spokio search, it will actually look at all the social media sites that are out there. Three of my married adult daughters will come up linked to me in this search because they've tagged me in pictures of the grandchildren by their married name because they've tagged me. Now, I've told them and warned them about the dangers of this. I've tried to emphasize the importance of protecting the family, but it still gets out. Son-in-law, somebody, daughter, whoever, tags me in a picture, and it creates a link between me and them. How scary would it be if I were able to find information about one of you and within three days send you a picture of me sitting on a park bench with one of your children where they go to school? Would that get your attention? There's been experiments where that's happened. There's a certain three-letter security agency on the other side of town here by the airport uh, we can't really talk about, uh, no such agency place or whatever. Um, there was a security consultant down there one time who did that. Notice there was a lot of people going into the gate that's marked NSA employees, right? We're real secretive about that. They were going in the gate, and he realized everybody had indicators and things that they were NSA employees on their cars or in their social networking, things of that nature. Went to the director and said, um, I think we got an OPSEC issue here. The people aren't really practicing good security in their communications. The director says, we've got this. We're the guys that know how to do this stuff. We're fine. He started a research using these tools. The director didn't have any information, Facebook or anything like that, to really go on, but his wife did. And his wife was connected to the daughter, who was at college on the other side of D.C. Within three days, he sent that director a picture of him sitting on a park bench in front of the dorm with the daughter because her social media page was wide open with complete class schedules and dorm address for all of her friends to find. So how can this be used against you? What kind of information is out there that will lead to this kind of an attack? Anybody have personalized plates on your car? Can anybody look at this personalized tag and tell me maybe where this person might work and what they do? Where do you think he works? Security Exchange Commission. What is his job? Database Administrator. I'm as proud of my job as anybody else, and I have no problem saying that. But this was on the back of a blue Porsche. Now, as a social engineer, I know one of two things. He's a senior DBA that can afford the nice car, or he's a junior DBA that's way in way over his head. Either way, it piques my interest, and I'm going to follow through. I could go online try to find this driver, this license plate registration, get public record searches, do those kind of things to find this information, who owns it. Or I could just go the old-fashioned way and follow him home and wait for the lights to go out and go to the garbage can and pull out a bill or two and see who they are and get information. This kind of information piques the interest of people looking for an opportunity. We don't realize that when we've set up these personalized tags like this. I thought I'd seen it all with this one. Okay, the slide deck didn't get updated right. This next one, there was an overlay supposed to go over this. The next license plate said DE space AGNT on the black, back of an Audi A6. Nice blonde young lady, DE agent. Yeah. First one said, hack me because I work for a bank or the banking commission. The second one, shoot me because I'm going to arrest you. People don't think about what they put on the back of their plate sometimes. It's not a bad thing to have personalized tags, but people don't think about that when their position should warrant better scrutiny. So I apologize. There were some overlays that apparently didn't get forwarded when it got updated. We can go online if you're an attacker, if you work in the hacking world and you're familiar with that. You can go online and buy these public records and get partial information about the registration. A good hacker 
we'll be able to know where the dark web lives and can go buy a stolen credit card with a limited uh, buying power, good pay record, and things like that for just a few dollars. Or it's gotten even better now. They don't even have to go to the dark web and buy a stolen credit card. They just take cash and go down to Walmart, buy a prepaid Visa card. So there's no attribution back to the person running or paying for this subscription. All right, that's the one thing the hackers don't want. They don't want to be traced. So they're going to do something where they can remove that attribution. So we can go pay the $25 fee, get the one-year subscription, and we can look up any license plates we want at that point and get registration information. So now we have a little exercise. Those of you with mobile devices, portable devices, go ahead and fire up your browser and do a Zaba search on your cell. Or I'm sorry, let's do Spokio. Let's do Spokio first. Just type in S-P-O-K-E-O, -E Spokio. And when the browser comes up, go ahead and put in your name and the town you live in. No more than that just your name and your town. All right? So it's Spokio.com and search for that. Does this have internet? Can we jump out of the slide? No. Okay. We're good. Give you a little time to pull this up. Have we got some results? Anybody got results yet? For those of you that don't have your mobile device with you, I do recommend you write these search engines down. And when you go back, either at home or, or on lunch today, do what they call an ego search. See what is tracked out there online to your name. Sometimes it will surprise you. Do we have any results yet? Anybody? You're, you're giggling here in the front. What did you find? Um, like old phone number, full email, two relatives, four locations. And you put all that there, didn't you? Of course not. OK. So full, full, full address, phone number, relatives, and previous addresses. Anybody else get results yet? Yes, sir. I think what they mean is you know, they say here, and it's right up everything from where I live here in Mexico, which is up here in Mexico. I'm sorry, he's going to bring the microphone to you so we can get this for the people on, that are online. I'm not used to that feature yet. Sure. I put my name in only, and it brought up all my addresses from, other than overseas, from uh, high school till now. Wow. Anything and else? It wasn't even in this area. It was like between Florida, California, Missouri, all over the place. And you can attribute all those to you? Right. Oh, yeah. You knew they were there? OK. Anybody else got results you want to share? <laughs> yes, sir. Picture of my house. Picture of your house. There's one more on here that I didn't put on here. That's a good point, sir. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody ever use Zillow to check your home values right, for your street address? What else does Zillow tell you about the neighborhood and community that house is built in? School districts, amenities for the community, parks and recreations, things that would attract buyers to that house. So again, can I take your name? Can I find your address? Can I find your children's school? Absolutely. Have I said anything to you in person yet at all? No. How many times do we answer these same social engineering questions online and don't even know it? Let's move on. So we talked about what we found. Some of the things that I would find, uh, I found all kinds of public records from pre-internet days. I found some articles that were related to my kids. My kids are involved in Civil Air Patrol. One of my sons received a uh, a, a, a top award, and he got his Amelia Earhart Award, uh, the local newspaper did an article on him. My name was mentioned in the paper. So there it was, news articles. Um, 
background criminal, criminal checks. We're all working in the government in one capacity as a contractor, full-time employee. You've gone through a background check, right? Those records that have been polled and queried are all there. You'll find those. All right, geotag data on your online photos, right? If you have a mobile phone, a mobile camera, if you have a good high-end digital SLR camera, chances are it's GPS enabled. And when you're taking pictures of where you're at on vacation or of your home or other things, if you haven't gone in and turned off the GPS location feature, it will give exact lat long coordinates where the picture were taken. Right? So if there's pictures of the house, if there's pictures of vacation and you're checking in on Foursquare or some other check-in site or even Google Plus now and you check in and I'm watching your accounts, I'll know that you're in New Mexico and your house is vacant at this time. Right? Things we don't think about. And there's all kinds of other sources we could go into. We, we listed some that you guys found here that may or may not have surprised you. So, let's take a look at some of the facts and stuff that I built into this uh, as I went through this. Ira Trainer is one of my um, pseudonames, I guess you'd call it, my alter egos. Um, when I look at this, I did a search on Ira. I found that Ira lived in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and has a LinkedIn page. Right? Not necessarily social in a networking page, it's a business networking. The functions and information there are just the same. I can glean a lot off of a public side of a LinkedIn page before I ever contact a person or log into my LinkedIn and request a connection. So we found out he's got a LinkedIn page. Let's take a look at this and see what it says about him. So we can look at this. We can see they're a developer, an IT consultant, self-employed, uh, did some business education specialist, went to Bemidji State University. Um, things that you can find out about this. If you go into the full profile, you'll find out that he's divorced, that he's working self-employed and loving it. So you can glean a lot before you ever leave this publicly available information because of the way these sites are set up. The whole purpose of this for a social engineer is to gain that knowledge that we need to have that plausible or credible story when we approach the guy. If I was to follow the man in the Porsche with the DBA license plate, find out who he is, get a little more information about him, maybe he frequents a, a sports bar every Thursday night on his way home from work. And I know enough about him, what football teams he likes, what sports he likes, I know he likes fast cars. I can strike up a conversation just as I did with Eric, right? Just as I did with Eric, establish a rapport, gain confidence, establish a connection to keep that relationship going so that I can continue to use that person to gain more insight, more information, and work my way in. Again, they may not be the end that I'm looking for. They may be a means to that end, or they might lead me to another person who is a bridge to get to the actual target. All this because of what we have on the internet through social media. So here we go, we look at uh, Ira again. A little more facts about him. We can go down here and look under favorites. Again, I can see, likes the Minnesota Vikings and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right? We could see the whole page. We'd find out more information about where he went to school, some of his other activities, such as he likes sports cars and sailboats and some other expensive hobbies. Right? When you can find people who have very distinctive hobbies, very distinctive interest, you can, as a social engineer, craft yourself enough knowledge to sound intelligent and talk to them about it. And once you gain confidence, it's amazing how people, our human nature, wants to be helpful. And they'll give up information without realizing it. Of course, you know, we could go a different way if we, looking at Facebook, you know, we can do the social engineering thing and stuff like that. We can try to hack into their Facebook. Or if we're a really shrewd, you know, really sharp kind of hacker, we just write our own app. Because once we write an app, it says I have to have permissions across the machine that's running that, whether it's a mobile device, a mobile app on your Android or Apple device, or if it's a home computer or a laptop or whatever, 
we write that application or that little game or that little widget so that it requires certain resources on that device, you've just given me permission to look at all the stuff on your hard drive. You've just given me permission to look at all of your contact list because you accepted the terms for that application when you downloaded it, whether you looked at the permissions I required or not. You accepted and agreed to my terms and conditions. So as a hacker, if I do a good game or a good tool that people start using, I can get into your mobile devices. Android devices, if you, how many Android? Okay, about half the room. Apple? There's the folks with the money. Okay. Um, Apple does a better job of screening the applications than Android does. Apple, you have to have a third party certificate verifying you, such as VeriSign, to be allowed to post to the iTunes store. Android does not. You can self certify. So as an attacker, I can write all kinds of malicious code, embed it into my application, upload it to Google's Play Store, and you can download it. Apple vets there's a little better, but Apple doesn't control all the updates to devices, and you can still get mobile attacks through updates. It's happened before. But with Android, you look at the application or the permissions for the application, and they're granular. They're not real granular. They're kind of nested. So if it says location, it doesn't tell you if it's fine or coarse location, if it's going to use GPS or if it's going to use cell phone triangula triangulation to pinpoint your coordinates. It just says it needs to access your location, it needs to access physical hardware. What does that mean? Right? It doesn't get real granular. When you actually write in the application the permissions that the application requires, you get very granular. I can turn on the camera, I can turn off the camera, I can turn on the microphone, all those things. Just write a good app. Get them to download it. The more people that download it, the more people you have that are possible subjects to exploit. So we've talked about a great deal of things, right? We've got addresses, we've got phone numbers, we've got history, we've got work information. If I could bring up a buddy Rob here, LinkedIn page, before I ever log into my LinkedIn page and look at his, I can find out all kinds of stuff about Rob. He's got a very, very well-built LinkedIn page that tells the social engineer quite a bit about it. And one of the things that I happened to catch on this, Rob, and I'm sorry, he lists his clearance on LinkedIn and it's available on public site. I know he's got a top secret. So again, do I target Rob? Maybe. But I put all that together, top secret clearance, works for the government, does contracting and coordination, and now is a project manager, program manager for a certain thing at State Department. May not be who I need to talk to about diplomacy or public issues or stuff going on at the State Department, but he could be a way in. So again, pull it all together, aggregate that data. Just like when we talk about PII, all the little pieces make the puzzle complete. All right, to show you a couple tools, uh, these are kind of complex. Maltigo is a community online that will let you drill in and find information about the people or the items you're looking for. Uh, there's a description right off their page from Paterba. Um, it's an in intelligence and forensics application. Originally, a lot of law enforcement were using this uh, for federal law enforcement and for intelligence agencies because we can actually map the nodes in a graphical manner and drill into the nodes and see where they exist on the internet. Uh, Node XL is another one that's free. It plugs into um, your XL program, uh, 2007, 2010, 2013. Um, plugs right in, allows you to do um, a, graphing, a graphing of the borders and boundaries of different nodes or addresses on the internet. So what this looks like with Maltigo, when we look at this, if I look up the Facebook for Ira Trainer, I center on that, then I start to see where the connections are to Ira. I can drill into those connections, find connections for those connections. I can go down to tertiary level on connections and links that Ira might have in his online presence. So as an attacker, I have a subscription to this or I bought this software package and that allows me to graphically see who's related and how they're related and 
try to exploit that relationship by drilling in. And this is really great when, we, when we're talking with forensics experts because now if you're doing online forensics, you can look at the nodes, you can see where the traffic might be going and who might be seeing it and listening to it. But again, a social engineer can do the same thing with your Facebook page and find all those other links that might be out there that would be of interest to them. Coworkers, associations you might be involved in, things like that. The Node XL plugs directly in, and you can see that when we did a search here, um, I come up and it draws a, a graph here on the side, which isn't really great. Um, I was looking for Ira Trainer in this one again, and I didn't get a whole lot of hits on him, just the Facebook page and the LinkedIn page. So I said, hmm, what would Captain Kirk do? So then I did a YouTube search for Captain James T. Kirk. And without doing anything else on the internet, all the YouTube connections that feed in anything to do with James T. Kirk pop into Node XL. Very little effort. If I have a real target as a social engineer and I drop it in the Node XL, I can start mapping out all the connections that might lead me back to you or a coworker or somebody else that I need to get to on the inside of your organization. These little more advanced tools take a little more learning skill uh, to ramp up with these. They're certainly something everybody can learn to use. They're not that difficult. But again, you have to spend a little time in configuring them to get the results you're looking for. So a couple of real world examples. Uh, a couple years back, 2008, Matt Hahnen was an author, contributing author to Wired Magazine. He should know about cybersecurity, right? Writes for Wired Magazine. Hackers found his Twitter name, thought it was comical, decided they would have some fun with him. They completely destroyed his digital life. Matt's big mistake, he used the same password across multiple accounts and multiple devices. It cost him over $1,700 to have his Mac Airbook hard drive scanned with an electron microscope to get back the pictures of his one-year-old daughter because they bricked everything he had that was an eye device, his iPhone, his iPad, and his Mac Airbook. Bricked them all through the iCloud, took over his Twitter account, started putting out all kinds of profane things on his Twitter account, took over his Google account because he made the fatal mistake of using the same password across all those accounts. So again, there's a couple articles that were written by him about the attack, how it happened, what he did to clean it up, and what he would recommend you do to prevent it from happening again. We talk about this in trying to protect ourselves and protect our information and our family. Um, occasionally, thank goodness, on a rare basis, this does have some serious consequences. Remember the Robin Sage experiment? How many friends can she get? This one came up a couple years back too. Uh, in Afghanistan, there were some Australian soldiers who were killed because this lovely young lady who obviously wants to help them with their Sunday school lessons um, friended them and they accepted that friend request. Well, once he accepted the friend request of this person who was actually a Taliban soldier, all their geotag pictures, all the information about their camp, all the information they had posted for family and friends became available to this so-called person. They were killed within three days of making the friend request. So it can have serious consequences in certain theaters. Not that that's going to happen, hopefully never happen with anybody here in the States, but again, that's the extreme and it can happen, it has happened. So how do we protect this data, things that we can do? Some suggestions. Periodically go out there and check your information. See what's online. See what's out there that's exposing you that you don't know about. Some of the stuff you can control. The Zaba search, Pipple, Spokio. You can claim your profile. You can go in there and ask them by registering with them to limit the amount of information that's returned on a search for your name. Now, I've never tried that. I don't know if that's an ongoing thing where you need to keep setting that and requesting that as information pops up or if that's a one-time thing. 
But if you do that, then going forward, you would want to be proactive about the kind of information you post online or release online about yourself so that you are not contributing or adding to the information that they can aggregate. All right? Be aware. We've always heard that, that mantra that everybody says, you know, if you wouldn't want anybody else to read it, don't put it online. All right? Because if it goes online, it's going to be seen somewhere, somehow. One last thing, has anybody ever heard of the Wayback Machine? And I'm not talking about Mr. Peabody. Okay, we have in the front here. The Wayback Machine is a group of people on the internet that archive websites. The first website that I built for a company when I first came out of school back in the early 2000s, I can go to the Wayback Machine and still retrieve a version of that website as it was built in 2002. So they archive stuff. So there's a permanence of things on the web that we need to be aware of. With that, I think we're up to question and answers. All right? Things to be aware of. We talked about all that, the geotagging, stuff like that. Uh, just practice due diligence. Use some forethought before you post. And questions and answers. Wow. Did I do that good of a job? I have a question up front here. So uh, looking at your presentation, um, do you do any sort of education or tailoring towards the younger generations, the millennials and such? Because as baby boomers and, and Gen Xers, if you will, we know. We're, we're generally private people. You know, We don't want to fool with all that technology. But as the younger generations come up and they have the latest and greatest, you know, oh, look, I'm able to share how I tied my shoes this morning. Do you have any sort of education or um, yeah, education tailored towards those groups? Um, from what we do at Information Assurance Branch, we don't, we deal with the, the government professionals and people already established. The millennials are coming into the workforce they're getting the same kind of awareness training. The Generation X people and Millennial, I like to look at them in different lights because the Millennial people basically have that technology since they were old enough to carry it. I mean, they've had the cell phone, they've had the computer access. My youngest children don't know what it's like to be without a computer or to have to share a computer, right? It's hard to make them understand that just because society has fostered this, this openness it's hard to get through to them the criticality of this. Uh, we haven't tailored anything specific for that. Uh, I, I see a need for it, like you say. I just don't know how I would approach that because it's going to be totally contrary to what they believe in. Um, they are, by their nature, millennials are an open society. And it's, it's going to be difficult to you know, convey that. Um, good awareness, uh, I, I heard Mr. Nelson talk about that, you know, and I heard it talked about earlier. Good awareness, promoting awareness if you're an ISSO and you're in charge of security for your system. Just those little posters about beware, you know. These things can get you. Uh, certainly this presentation is tailored to cover everybody. Um, but then you get people who, unfortunately, um, as we've had the leaks in the last few years with Snowden and others uh, and, and Manning, they believe they're entitled to do this. And it's hard to combat that theory or that, that way of thinking. Anything? Yes. Yes, the lady in the back here. He's bringing a mic to you, ma'am. How often should you change your personal, I mean, your password on, like, bank accounts and things like that? Because Changing your personal uh, account passwords and using different account passwords is critical. Um, we have a policy at most agencies you do it 45 to 60 days for a reason. Um, you should probably make a practice of doing it on a frequent basis yourself at home. Um, I try to do mine about every two months, every 60 days, change mine myself um, as a personal policy. Um, but you need to change them frequently. And any time that you have reason to believe they might be uh, compromised, you can look at the public information, the news articles, and everything that's in the press, and you'll read about all these passwords that were compromised on Google. That's a good trigger, even if you haven't done it, you know, you just did it two weeks ago, and you see that 
an article saying passwords are compromised by these hackers, that's a good motivation or trigger to go change your password at that time. Because if they've captured any passwords that belong to you in that grab before it got locked down, changing it will hopefully cut them off before they can decrypt all that. Now, with, depending on the, the complexity of the password, how strong your personal passwords are, they might be easily broken within a matter of days, or they may never break them, depending on the algorithms they're using to try to brute force the, the passwords. So frequently changing them or on a trigger event is what I usually go by. Okay? Anybody else? Yes, sir. A, a very brief comment that corporations are also sometimes guilty of posting too much online, i.e. Oh. on Monster or on their own uh, job websites as far as this is, this is the type of network administrator and this is the type of skills he needs and this is the background he needs. And this is exactly what we're currently short on. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely a good suggestion, one that I don't bring up here because you know, I, I centered this around social media and, and personal information. But you're absolutely right, sir. Uh, contractors, I mean, kind of companies put information about their job skills that they're looking for. As an attacker, as a hacker, thinking in that way, you know, I could do a quick job search to see what they're looking for as far as skill sets. You know, I could actually try to find out what kind of systems they have uh, as far as hardware and operating environments, which would give me a better mechanism or idea of how to go about my attack. Um, you know. Obviously, hackers are looking for low-hanging fruit. They want the easiest way in. They don't want to spend a lot of effort if they don't have to. You know, so due diligence says let's make it a little harder than the next guy. That's that old joke. You know, you don't have to outrun the bear, just the the guy you're with, right? So, just one thing to add with regard to the personal security thing that uh, Tim was alluding to earlier. Uh, a lot of commercial companies today, be it, you know name any large corporation. They themselves are using sites like Pipple and Spokio to screen candidates coming into their companies. So when you're talking to millennials, you know, tell them, hey, if you're looking for a job with a truly reputable company and you've got things about a bong party on your Facebook page, chances are you're not going to get a job interview. Very true. Very true. Yes, sir. I, I would like to know when you go online, that the different sites that you visit, let's say that you do banking or, or doing some uh, search on anything, all of that, can, can that information be tracked? And, and like even if you are already not, uh, let's say that you, you log off, is that information somehow is available for a hacker to, to find out what, what is, where you go surfing and all of that? Um. I wish I had a clearer answer than it, than it depends. Um, <laughs> depends on the activity. If you're in an online banking system, per se, you should have some kind of secure connection to them through some kind of encryption. And when you connect to that, that site, it should request that your credentials be sent to an encrypted mechanism through SSL or some other socket layer um, security protocol. Um, that way, if you, even if the hacker does see the traffic going through, it's encrypted and it's hard for them to in interpret. Now, other online activities, you know, may or may not do that. A good indicator if you're in IE or in Chrome is to look for the little lock that says it's, secure, it's a secure site or it has secure protocols. But then SSL recently had to undergo a major overhaul because of Heartbleed, all right, where they were compromised that SSL certificate and it could read the results of that on the memory of the server. So again, depends. Like for example, you go to Amazon and you buy some stuff, they, they will know that, or if you uh, do a search for any specific uh, subject, like let's say you're doing an investigation on something, is that in, and you go to different sites for that. Um, typically that, it could, it's potentially, it is a potential. Yeah. It is a potential that if, if somebody is monitoring your online activities or monitoring that website and seeing who connects to it, absolutely they can see your traffic. Um, if there's an exchange, financial exchange, you want to make sure you're using encryption uh, and secure security on that act transaction. Um, Amazon was one of the problems that got Matt Hanen because his credit card information was there and it was tied to a password reset process 
So they did have that information there. The attackers were able to use that against them uh, by seeing the online activities. Now, they would have to somehow intercept your traffic between the two points in order to know what you were looking at and what you were buying. But if they could gain access to the, the Amazon servers, they could probably do some kind of compromise to retrieve data from the caches. That's what the Heartbleed did. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? How are we doing for time? Okay. Everybody good? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. You've been a great group. I appreciate your participation. Um, have a good day. Enjoy the rest of the speakers. Thank you, Rob and Tim, again for your uh, presentation. We'll go ahead and take a 15-minute break and start back up at about 10.35. Thank you.
nothing's on yet.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started again. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. James Stanger from CompTIA. He's going to be providing a presentation on what your mobile phone says about you. Um, James is a writer, web technologist, security consultant, and open sources advocate. He currently works at CompTIA where he helps develop its certifications. He was formerly president and chief certification architect at Certification Partners LLC, owners of the Certified Internet Web Professional Certification Program. Uh, James has created certifications and courses of instruction for companies and organizations such as CIW, IBM, Symantec, and CompTIA. A respected speaker, he has, been invited, he has been invited to present at various forums in the UK, China, the Middle East, and North America. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm going to turn this thing on. I'm James Stanger. Pleased to meet all of you. I'm from an organization called CompTIA. CompTIA does certifications. We're also a membership organization, and we represent the IT industry. We, as part of that representation of the IT industry, sell certifications and offer certifications from A+, which is all about the help desk and all about uh, providing IT help desk support, to, uh, to Network Plus, which is all about networking and routing, to Security Plus, CASP, and many others. In fact, we have about 17 or 18 certifications that we offer. I'm here today to talk about mobile phone security. But before I do that, I did want to mention a couple of things. Remember, I said we do a lot of certifications. Uh, who here may have heard of the A Plus certification? I certainly have. Bunch of you. OK. Do you know what's going on this week? Any idea of what just happened this week in regards to A+. Just want to throw this out there. We will be certifying, we have certified, our one millionth person for that. So a million people have just been certified. It's need to be part of something uh, where we help out the IT industry in such a big way. With uh, CompTIA, we uh, offer help with the 8570 certification. We work closely with the NICE initiative. Uh, thus, that's just in the United States, and we do many things globally. In fact, I'm heading over to Dubai in a week, and, and uh, in about a month, I'm heading on over to uh, uh, the UK to uh, do a lot of work. My job at CompTIA is basically to design cr and uh, create and manage the certifications. So I'm in charge of all of the certifications. So I'm very, very pleased to be here. And thank you very much to uh, uh, CMS for, uh, uh, for bringing me on in. You know, today we're going to talk about what your mobile device says about you. Now, it's mobile phone, mobile device. This is my mobile phone. It's not a particularly sexy mobile phone. It's a Samsung Galaxy S4. What do you folks have? Why don't you grab your phones out real quick or your mobile devices? Maybe some of you have, uh, uh, we have a laptop over here. I see, uh, uh, hold up the laptop there. We, we want to show the, uh, the caveman here. All right, there you go. No, I, I've got one as well and I live in my laptop because I still find laptops, notebooks to be uh, kind of the device of productivity. That's kind of the way I see it. But all right, hold up your phone, see what you got here, guys. All right, uh, okay, everybody, Android? Android, got there? All right. We already did this with uh, Tim, who, by the way, told me he was CIW certified. That was cool. I used to run that program for years. Uh, uh, so, Tim, how you doing? Uh, you're Android or are you a mobile uh, iPhone? Android. Droid? All right. I'm a droid person. Okay. How many iPhone folks? All right. Now, here's what I want you all to do. Could you, could you all stand up here? Could you all stand up for me? Okay. Because this is all about, take a look at this agenda. We're going to be going over this agenda, but I want to do something. I want to take a selfie. Okay. We're going to do a selfie, all right? Can you guys help me out and do that? Come on over here. I want you guys to come on over here, and uh, we're going to do a uh, phone here uh, thing. Come on, everybody, g gather around as close as you can. Get over here. We're going to do a selfie. I want to see if we can pull this off here, okay? All right, let's see if I know how to. Um, how do I set up this uh, thing so that it does selfie mode? All right, there we go. I think I'm doing that. Is that right? Okay. So let's see here. We'll set this up here. Actually, I'll ha no, I can't have you do it. That wouldn't be good. Okay, so let me set this thing up here real quick. All right, am I doing this right? All right. Okay, everybody, close. Oh, come on, we got to get closer. Again. And hold up your phones. Hold up your phones. Everybody, get your phones out. All right. Hold up your phones. Here we go. Thank you. All right. All right, after three. One, two, three. Am I taking that there? 
All right, there we go. Everybody smile. Everybody smile. There we go. Okay, I will take a stop it there and I will take it on to picture one more time. And there we go. Thank you very much, everybody. Everybody sit down here. Now take a look at this agenda while you're, while you're sitting down. First of all, what did I just do? I tried to capture your interest, tried to kind of get you back in the field after, uh, back in the room after going out there talking to folks. Sure, okay? I also now have a selfie that I can send out to folks uh, and prove to my boss that I've actually been working for a living. He's not too sure about that. You know what I also could have done? Possibly. Who here has ever heard of something called near field communication, NFC? First time I ever heard of NFC, I went no further changes. I started out as an uh, editor, as a publisher. And that NFC meant that you had written a document to a point where there ain't going to be no more changes, NFC. I'm like, no further changes in a phone? What does that mean? Well, let's get started with some basic uh, concepts here. Because what I possibly could have done, don't worry, I didn't. What happens if you had near-field communication enabled and I had near-field communication enabled while we were doing the pho the pho this, this phone selfie thing? Conceivably, I could have grabbed data from your phone. Okay? Conceivably. All right? Supposedly, you're supposed to be able to touch the phone and everything, but these days it's getting more and more. My point being, your mobile phone, as you do usual or unusual activities, can, folks, be seen as leaking data. So I want to get in in the short time that I have. What time do I have, uh, have to be off? It's at 11.30, isn't that right? In the short time that I have, I want to set the frame. So let's talk about the scary stuff. I was once at a, a security seminar where the C uh, person said, if you wanted to hack the CEO, how would you hack the CEO? How would you do that? And people are like, well, I would try to find a way into the home. I would try to find a way into the PC or whatever. Well, there's a lot of answers. One, maybe instead of trying to get to that uh, CEO as he or she is traveling, maybe the ad administrative assistant to the CEO might be a better target. Because in a larger company, a CEO is going to have a, a cadre of bodyguards or whatever. But how about the CEO's mobile device? The concept I want to bring out here is a concept that's been in the security industry for a long time. It's called the attack surface. Anybody ever heard of that concept before? The attack surface of a company? With the mobile phone people, the attack service of a surface of a company has gotten far larger. Back in the day, the attack surface was maybe the firewall or the PCs in the company or the servers, the web server, the database server, the e-commerce server that has all those nice juicy car credit cards. Nowadays, all of that information is carried right here. A company's attack surface has gotten far, far larger. Let's talk about some of the ways that a mobile phone can track you. The phone's tilt sensor and keyboard, right? You know about the tilt sensor, don't you, right? And it, the, the phone vibrates nicely, right? Now, a really smart person in your calculus class back when you were in high school, I, would, I say your calculus class because I wasn't bright enough in high school to be in calculus, okay? But that smart person, they have the ability to create an application that maps movement, okay? That maps movement from a remote keyboard to the phone lying next to you as you type. I'll get into that in just a second. GPS tracking. All of our phones have GPS. What about that USB charger at the airport? Who here? charges your phone at the airport. I do it all the time. You know those really nice kiosks that are all set up and ready to go? You just plug in your USB and all that stuff. Why is that a good idea? Well, if, if, if your phone is anything like mine, I usually suck it dry by at least 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Maybe by noon. Okay? I always need to juice the thing up. That USB charger. Who set that USB charger up? Here's a story. I was once going through the airport, very hurriedly, LAX. This is back in the day when mobile phones really sort of existed, but they were the Gordon Gecko-like mobile phone about this size. Interestingly enough, with the iPhone 6, I think we're getting back to the Gordon Gecko iPhone. I think they're getting larger all the time, but I mean, the uh, Gordon Gecko phone. But this is kind of in the days before cell phones became big, and guess what? I had to take um, a phone call through the good old... Um, uh, through the good old uh, uh, payphone. 
And uh, that, this is in the days when pay phones weren't just a quarter, had to make a long distance thing, so I used my credit card. Guess what? Some clever person, probably an employee there at, uh, uh, at LAX uh, doing bad things that you know, LAX never knew about, had set up a sniffing card, right? Had set up a sniffing function and had grabbed a bunch of people's credit card data. And for the next month and a half, I had all sorts of, uh, what, phone calls charged to all sorts of illicit websites, pornography websites charged to my number. Okay, about, I remember the first month was about 1800 bucks, second month was about 1600 third month was about zero because, I, you know, they, they called me, AT&T called me and said, are you aware of all these charges? I'm like, no. What does that have to do with mobile phone security? There are all sorts of ways that as you plug in that US, your phone to that USB charger, you never know what is, in on the, what is sniffing on the other end of that USB charger. Just a thought. Analogy time. Analogy time. Let's bring it in. You all have heard of the Exxon Valdez, right? What happened? Huge oil slick, right? Big disaster. In security, when it comes to security, what do we tend to think about? We tend to worry about the big disasters, right? Right? The Home Depot disaster, right? The huge issues. If you're old like me, you might remember the Robert Morris internet worm, or you might remember the I love you, or the Melissa virus, or if you're less old, you might remember the Stuxnet thing that happened to the Iranian uh, centrifuges and all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Those are the biggies, right? What does this have to do with the Exxon Valdez? I come from the Puget Sound. I do a lot of diving, a lot of kayaking. And you know what the biggest worry for the Puget Sound is? It's not so much another Exxon Valdez coming in and dumping a bunch of oil. It's the little drops come of oil coming out of your car that represent a very slow, constantly moving oil slick that is hurting the ocean. Okay? What does this have to do with mobile phone security? I think that if I lose my data, it's a huge deal. You probably don't think it's a huge deal if I lose my data or somebody socially engineers me or that I am leaking data. You, of course, worry about your own data. My point is, is that each of us kind of represents a little drop of oil coming out of the engine, a constant, steady flow of information that is usually unchecked. So the reason why we're here at CompTIA talking about mobile phone security today is to basically say, you know, what are some ways that you can protect yourself as you get online? So we all know about the mobile phone's G, uh, GPS. Here's the story. Over the past few years, create, uh, hackers have created malware. And we all know about key loggers, I think. Like on your Windows system, some bad guy can come in, right? And she can install a little piece of software that can log every keystroke and report it back to a central server, and they've got all sorts of information. That's been around for years, 20 years more. Well, now hackers have been able to do this. Suppose your phone has some form of malware installed. Now. You set your mobile phone down next to where, as you type an email into your normal computer. Okay, so you're typing an email into your normal computer. Or you're logging in to your computer. Guess what this phone can do if it has malware installed? Even if you're not typing into the phone, guess what it can do? It is smart enough because it can sense vibration. It can figure out what keys you are typing into a standard American keyboard. And it can extrapolate that information and send information from your, from your phone to a hacker. And that person is capturing your keystrokes, even without keystroke uh, software attached to your computer. Do you see how powerful a phone can be? So the idea, let me get some essential concepts around. Because without these essential concepts, I think mobile phone security becomes more of a scare fest than a practical discussion. Data in use. What does that mean? That means data as you're working on it, as it's stored in temporary memory, either on your phone or on your iPad or wherever. Then there's data at rest. What does that mean? What does data at rest mean, guys? Folks? Louder. Stored data. Okay? Stored data, it's on a solid state drive, it's in a voicemail somewhere, backed up somewhere, stuck somewhere. Then there's data in transit. That means as it's flying, as I say, because I'm old fashioned, across the network wire, or it's flying across the air, there's, that's data in transit. You've got to protect this data no matter what state it's in. And the question becomes, 
how are you protecting that data? As it transmits from one phone to the other, is it really secured all that well? Uh, so there are all sorts of considerations here in regards to encryption. Other essential terms. Each phone has a radio, at least really two. What radios would they be that are on a phone? You didn't realize this was a class, did you? Uh, how many radios, and I'll use that term loosely, are in a phone, folks? I can think of at least two. How about the one that connects to your cell tower? Fair enough? Right? To your mobile phone provider, uh, AT&T, Verizon, wherever you are. Then, of course, there's the radio, the Wi-Fi radio, right? You know what I'm talking about? The Wi-Fi that actually connects through a network, okay? That's another radio. There's near field communication, not really a radio, but it definitely is a transmitter function, okay? Then, of course, so you got your Wi Fi, you got your Bluetooth, right? That's another form of radio. What is Bluetooth for? That's really for from, from me to about the front row, maybe a little further, right? That makes it so that as you connect, as you sit down in your uh, uh, car driving home today, your Bluetooth will connect and your MP3s will play and everybody's happy, or at least you are. Um, so there's some uh, terms there. Those are radios. Moving on, read-only memory, okay? Read-only memory. Has anybody here ever rooted their phone before? That's a real geek thing to do. All right, you fellow geeks, thank you very much. Rooting your phone. Um, I won't have you say it, uh, what it is, but rooting your phone is really cool. Uh, why would you ever do such a thing? When you buy a phone, there's all that wonderful software on there that you never use occupies all sorts of memory, slows the phone down. By rooting your phone, you can actually get rid of that stuff. It's kind of cool. But also by rooting your phone, you can add all sorts of fancy uh, programs where you can turn this into a network auditing device. But you can also use your, uh, a, a brand new, uh, you can have multiple operating systems or versions of operating systems that boot into the same phone. So as your phone starts up, you get a little menu. Yeah, do you want a normal phone today? Do you want a hacked up phone? What do you want today? What does that have to do with anything? Data at rest. How many of you encrypt the files stored on your disk? I mean, truly scramble them each time. We do, all right? Anybody else? You're afraid to say? Right? If you don't, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what does it matter? With my phone, for example, every time you, if you were to pick up my phone, you'd have to enter a security code in there, and I'm not telling you what it is, all right? So this is a security code there. That's great, but you know what? If somebody was able to power down my phone and start it back up again, guess what? There's not a boot, the boot sequence is not protected and they'd be able to put another read-only memory device, uh, a piece of software on this. My point being that they, with, unless I encrypt my files at rest, which I have done, unless I do that, all somebody has to do is to uh, put on another version of Android. It'll go out and read those hard drives and read that data all day long. So unless you are storing your data at rest, you are not going to have as secure a phone as you thought. If we are after the CEO's information, or if somebody's after information that you happen to have on your phone, how hard could it be to separate your, you from your phone and to do that? This is the point. Mobile phone security, very important. I won't go into too many other details, but there are attack vectors that are going on all of the time. One of the big ones that seems to be happening, uh, according to research we've done at CompTIA, is spoofing. Good old spoofing. What is spoofing? That simply means a device or a person imitating something that it isn't, okay? Counterfeiting, as it were. And there's lots of spoofing going on. I'll get to it in a minute. Man in the middle attacks. Remember I was talking about data uh, in motion, right? Man in the middle attacks take advantage of TCP, IP, take advantage of these protocols that as connections start, as connections begin, a bad guy will come in and manipulate that connection. I think we've all gone in before and shook somebody's hand. Have you ever been at a party before where you go to shake somebody's hand and guess what happens? You go to shake their hand and you think that they're coming to shake your hand and guess what? They're going to shake the hand of the person behind you, right? And guess what happens? You're like, ugh, right? Think of a handshake. Computers are constantly handshaking with each other. A bad guy knows how to go in and break up that connection and create all sorts of things. Uh, it creates all sorts of problems. And that way they can spoof uh, connections. 
Denial of service is an issue, sure. Buffer overflows are a major issue. These are the types of attack vectors that are happening, but spoofing especially. And of course, social engineering, which Tim did a great job uh, discussing. We also have a term in here that I want to point out called metadata. How about that, metadata? That's one of those terms that was really big about a year ago. Remember, the NSA was saying metadata. Uh, don't worry, we're not watching, uh, or companies too, we're not grabbing actual data. We're only grabbing metadata. Well, I'll explain what metadata is, because actually it is a big deal. OK, uh, some terms there. <sighs> Touch screen key loggers, they exist. The kind of old hat, they've been around. Gestures, the motion sensors, the tilt, all of these things are things that you need to think about in regards to mobile phone security. Let's get a bit deeper. There's a concept called tower spoofing. Uh, and I already introduced spoofing, things that say they are but uh, legit, but they aren't. Uh, I think we've all heard about how some bad person, she can go to uh, Starbucks, right? Anybody ever, I, uh, I don't really go to Starbucks, but I go to places, internet cafes around the world, and I'll log into a Wi-Fi network, right? Sometimes you have to pay, sometimes you don't. Sometimes they're free. And you have that at Starbucks or anywhere else, right? I think we've all heard about how it's possible for a bad guy to do what? to set up a fake mobile phone, uh, excuse me, a fake hotspot, Wi-Fi hotspot, right? I think we've heard of that. Well, it is just about as easy, just about as easy for a bad guy or the police or anybody else, right, to set up a fake tower, a fake, fake cell phone tower. And so now you can spoof a tower. I grabbed this uh, I grabbed this uh, here off, I think, from USA Today. So it's uh, my PowerPoint slide says, thank you, USA Today. But I bring this little graphic up here, because notice this is a what uh, police will often call a stingray, uh, a stingray outfit. And it's basically a, 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 mobile phone, a, a mobile truck that has lots of equipment in it that spoofs a cell phone tower. Police use it basically to go and grab uh, data from bad guys and that sort of thing. My point being, since that was done, you know, years ago, you could probably have that same equipment in something that's not nah, a little larger than a briefcase, but much more mobile than that. My point is, is that as you are connecting your phone to a cell phone tower, you can't necessarily be sure that it really is a legit cell phone tower. They're around, and it's become more and more available, is my point. So that's tower spoofing. There's certificate impersonation. We've known for years about the ability to clone a mobile phone. Uh, and of course, Stingray has to do with, uh, and again, your mobile phone, of course, is set to go to the best mobile tower, isn't it? So a bad guy, or, or a legit person even, will basically create a fake cell phone tower that is more attractive to your phone. So it wants to go to the stronger signal rather than the weaker signal. And they can grab all sorts of data. Let's talk a bit about how your mobile phone tends to leak data. And this concept of metadata, I think, is something that it was, it was a buzz phrase that was uh, thrown around all the uh, news engines for a long time. And I'm not sure it was particularly well described. Metadata has certain, a lot of definitions. Uh, um, they are identifiers, OK? Identifiers of networks. As your mobile phone connects to a tower, there's all sorts of gener data generated. Not necessarily that voice signal, but all of the connection data generated around it. That metadata is available. And it's available not just to the NSA, not just to companies. It's available to a great many people. OK, so any information from a data resource as it is used. All physical data and knowledge from inside and outside an organization. This is metadata. So metadata can be treated as an artifact that shows how information is created. It is also information in and of itself. And there's generally two types of metadata, technical and business. So examples of metadata. GPS data called geotagging, as Tim called it. Right? You take a picture like the selfie there. If I have that ena it enabled, which a lot of people do, and I'll explain more in a minute about how things get enabled on mobile phones, that GPS data can get tagged and does get tagged into not only images, but also documents, uh, email, emails, that sort of thing. Timestamps, associated applications that processed the, uh, the data, weather information, user profile information. 
metadata is the time that a document was created, the time that it was modified, uh, and the location. And the location. Uh, cookies. Remember when cookies were evil? Do you guys remember this? Back when cookies were, you know, got to block all the cookies, right? Now we kind of treat them as standard and that's fine. Cookies are kind of an example of metadata, right? You go do something, visit a website, and then all sorts of g g data is generated about what you just did, okay? There's also USB connection data. Remember about five, ten minutes ago I was making a big deal about going through the airport and charging your phone? Notice this up here. Uh, 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 up here, the idea of USB connection data. As you create a connection, even charging, information about the device that's used, the time of the connection, the bandwidth used, serial numbers of the device, that all can be captured and, and grabbed. Does that mean somebody's grabbing your info? No, but they are grabbing info about you and what you're doing and where you are. In this day of big data, where seemingly silly, innocuous, unimportant data can be captured and grabbed, the more that that data is captured and grabbed, the more people can start to draw conclusions about you, no matter how obscure that data is. Don't get paranoid. It will be OK. OK? But it's something to think about. Network connections, IP address, IPv4, your internet service provider, all of the ports that you tend to use. It doesn't, I don't need to know what you watch on Netflix necessarily, but all I need to do is find out, hmm, well, her, her uh, Netflix traffic spikes between 8 and 10. I have a real good idea what she's doing at, between 8 and 10 at night. Uh, connection times and places. I also know when she's doing it and where she's doing it. Oh, she's doing it through a mobile phone. So she happens to be over to friends most of the time. You can create tremendous actionable information. And that is today what bad guys and good guys want to do. They want to generate actionable information off of us. Whether it be something as good as Amazon.com figuring out, I have a good idea what James wants to buy tomorrow and I'll make it easy for him. Is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily. To as bad as, I know where James is going to be tomorrow. I can rob his house or do all sorts of things. Right? Uh, when it comes to other things, there's browser activity. When it comes to making a phone call, here is an example of the metadata that your phone generates on a second by second basis. The route from your phone to various towers. Phone numbers that are start the call and end the call. Okay? The mobile subscriber identity and equipment identity number. That means they know what service carriers you're, you're using. The time and duration of the call. All of these things, comprehensive communications, routing information, are all things that are basically fair game out there for private companies and governments alike. Okay? I especially like, uh, in one of the descriptions put out by the NSA, they use the term et cetera. I love that term. Et cetera is a great term. There's something, the reason I say it's a great term is I, wor I work with a lot of contracts. Uh, you don't put et cetera into a contract, okay? You just don't, because it can mean anything. Um, so metadata myths. Metadata, one of the myths is metadata is difficult to obtain or read. No, and I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it can't be changed, or at least not easily. In other words, it can't be spoofed. Uh, it can be, actually. Another myth is that it creates a lot of space on a hard disk. It can't be stored easily. No. St we've handled storage pretty well. At CompTIA, we work with an organization called the Storage Networking, uh, with SNEA uh, uh, Association. Uh, they no they've forgotten more about storage than all of us, I think, will ever learn. Uh, storage is not an issue these days. That's why big data has become so big. Search engines use this information constantly. It's kind of a myth. They, they haven't quite started using it. I think they will. Uh, you can't remove it legally from your phone. Yeah, you can. Another myth is that adding photo metadata like copyright and contact information is difficult to do and time consuming. It's not. So uh, I know one guy, for example, that uses the term metadata framework constantly. He almost uses it like Father Marin in The Exorcist. You know, the, the power of metadata compels you. You know, it's like. It's not a buzz term, okay? It's, it's a very real thing. Uh, it's a techie term, but let's unpack it a little bit. Uh, you can read it, you can remove it, and you can tamper with it. These are examples of, of, of applications that you can use, download for free, uh, that you can view 
uh, all sorts of information that is stored in the headers of documents or images. Uh, we've all taken JPEGs and TIFFs and PNGs and all sorts of, of, of uh, graphics before. All of these th uh, things generate metadata. Well, so if you want to spoof or take a look at it, metadata, you can do it all day long, okay? Exif tool, you can go up, and again, any of these URLs, uh, this is just a bit of disclaimer. I'm not encouraging you to go do this on the job. Oh, why did you get yourself in trouble or get fired? Oh, James from CompTIA said I could. No, I didn't, okay? And I also warn you, as you go up to these uh, links, links can be changeable, people can buy them and abandon them and, and take them over, so be very careful as you download software, because I didn't make it, it's not mine, so be careful. Don't infect your system, and even if it doesn't infect your system, don't do bad things with it. Not condoning that or encouraging it. I'm reporting the types of tools that are used out there. This is, uh, uh, so EXIF tool is something that makes it possible for you to generate metadata. My point being that if I was a good lawyer and there was metadata saying, well, the metadata found on James's phone says that he was doing X, Y, and Z, unless I knew exactly how that data was created, it's possible to generate it yourself. Uh, but there's uh, JHEAD, and we'll take a look at that. There's FOCA. Uh, these are all uh, tools that are often used for ill purposes and for good purposes. Uh, so again, metadata can be used to dial in marketing information, can be used for crowdsourcing, to sell and purchase advertisements, to create viral campaigns. It can also become a pretext or a reason for obtaining a warrant. Okay? It can also be used by a bad person to learn more information about you for analytics and profiling. In other words, this is a tool that can be used in the same way any tool can be used for, for good or for ill. And the whole idea is that a hacker or a marketing person or a government person draws conclusions about certain things, about liaisons. Think of it this way. Imagine if you knew somebody had gone to an oncologist and then places a bunch of phone calls afterwards and a bunch of phone calls to family or whatever. What kind of conclusion would you be able to draw? Hmm? Yeah, that the news probably wasn't so good. Now, if it was a bunch of calls to people, that's great, but followed up by calls to the pharmacy and that sort of thing, could be that we've got ourselves somebody who's sick, right? So you can triangulate information and draw very, very good conclusions. And uh, our courts have consistently recognized that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in this type of metadata information. And I won't read this document fully. The point being that it's not just the government that's out to get you, so put on your tinfoil hat, right? This information is being used by various people, okay? Okay? So don't put on that tinfoil hat just yet. Uh, you know, the rule of law applies, at least I think it does. Uh, Companies generally want to save their reputations, but all of these organizations need to gather intelligence, identify risk, and protect assets, and, and metadata does that. Let's set the Wayback Machine. Somebody mentioned the Wayback Machine. You can go up to a URL and find out what IBM's website looked like in 1998. Well, let's set the Wayback Machine in our minds. Remember, so in the 90s, cookies were the enemy. Now, how many of you remember the Google Wi-Fi incident? Raise your hand, all right, I see a couple people. The Google Wi-Fi incident was, uh, we all know about Google Street View and how cool that is, right? People, uh, Google, they drop, drive their cars by and they take pictures and all that, and some people got a little worried about that. The thing that really worried people for a while anyway, and it still should, is as they were doing the drive-bys by your home, right, with Street View, what else were they capturing, folks? Everything about your Wi-Fi connection. Now, they weren't breaking into things and all that stuff. I'm not going to accuse them of that. But they can learn a tremendous amount of things from the names of your Wi-Fi connection. They can learn a tremendous amount of things about the fact that it's a certain uh, internet provider that is, part, that is uh, uh, providing internet service to uh, your company, uh, to your uh, company, to your uh, home. They can learn a tremendous amount of things about your purchasing uh, and data use. Uh, they could track you, invade your privacy, take over your system, allow companies to coll collaborate with you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, people got really upset about this. But it did more than just Street View. It captured and used that data. And what I want to point out, folks, is that an evil thing that they did? I don't know. I, maybe I'm a little laissez-faire. Maybe I'm a little too relaxed. But I do honestly think that it was an example 
of what companies continue to do and, and, and will do uh, uh, in the future. So uh, let's talk about some specific tools. FOCA. It can enumerate or capture capture metadata on various types of files. Office files, Word documents, PDF files, images, and web documents. And the whole idea is that it can say, it can find out very easily when they were captured. And you can run this application on a computer. You can also set it to a web server. And it will go up and grab all those documents. And it will find out who worked on it and when. If, as a hacker, I wanted to go in and find out, hmm, who works on what at CompTIA? Guess what I'd do? I'd start using FOCA and I would download documents either from somebody's mobile phone through a USB connection or through a web server where we make stuff readily available. I would download all those documents, those PDFs, those Word documents and other uh, spreadsheets, things like that, and I would start to find out, okay, who created that document? Because we all know Word uh, and Excel. What do they do? They capture usually the information about the person who created that. That tells me a lot about who does the work in an organization. It would help me as a hacker target somebody. If I was a marketing person, it would help me target their usage. There's the JHEAD application. This is just one of dozens of applications out there. And uh, with the name like JHEAD, as the name implies, it takes a look at the header information or the metadata information that is stored at the beginning of every file. And it allows you to view information there, and it allows you to rewrite information. So you can actually view the information, or you can create your own. This right here, I ran it from a Linux system of mine, right? And I ran it against this JPEG here, and notice the information that it gave, okay? About the resolution, exposure, and all that sort of thing. It even tells me what kind of camera was used. Well, that's not particularly revealing. Let's take a look at something in real life. And this is something that Tim uh, alluded to. Uh, take a look at the picture, right? Pretty cool rig, right? That's mine, okay? Uh, anybody know what this is? This old car? Anybody a Land Cruiser nut like I am? It's not a Jeep. Looks like a Jeep. It's a Land Cruiser, right? I'm also a kayaker, right? Tell me, folks, you know, what can you learn about this photo? Take a look at it carefully. Raise your hand or just shout out what kind of things can you learn from this photo just looking at it? Yeah, in the back. Serial number or name, you're talking about this right here? That's the name of the boat. Okay, so now you kind of have an idea of what uh, I've bought before. And trust me, it was expensive. Mm. Anyway, but it's a great boat. What else can you learn about the guy who took this photo, or at least this guy's stuff? What? Outdoorsy person, right? I mean, notice this here. Maybe he likes to go camping. That's a five-gallon five gas thing, right? You know, maybe he's out there doing some sort of kayaking safari, who knows, right? But outdoor person, whatever, okay? This has metadata information, this picture. This is a Linux application that I ran. Uh, this is the, the Bash shell, which has run into problems lately in security <laughs> itself. But I ran the JHEAD application against that picture that you just took. And here's a bunch of gibberish that comes out of it, okay? Right? What interesting do you think, what could help you if you had tons of information, tons of these pictures from me, from Kevin, from others, right? What kind of information could you learn? Well, he's an Android guy. Yeah. How, how is that possible? Give me a break. From this, old, hold on, from this picture, that's impossible, right? From this picture, how could you learn where I live? Well, maybe. It's like, well, it's probably, it looks green, right? But how could that tell you? There it is. See the GPS stuff there? Right? And you're probably thinking to yourself, if you're ahead of the game, you're like, well, I already disabled that, James. Don't worry about it. But here's my point. How many of you have kids and you let them use their phone, uh, your phone, right? And you're probably saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to admit it, but everybody does. How many of you download new applications all the time because they're cool? Did you know that a lot of applications not so loudly activate GPS even when, and other tracking features, even when you've disabled it. Okay, if you're not careful. If you're not careful. They're not evil. They're not trying to hose you over or anything like that, but they will activate certain features. So yes, this picture has GPS, longitude, and data. So I'm going the wrong way. So this application 
is able to do something. So from captured GPS data that's embedded in the image, right, you can find out very easily exactly, if not where I live, at least where this picture was taken, okay? And I'll admit it, this was taken at my house, okay? But notice what this, phone, this image did here. This is actually a, uh, the image that you saw starts about right here. This here is a screen capture that I took on my phone, right? How did my phone know all of this? It knew it was a cloudy day that day, there's AccuWeather, right? It was able to take that GPS data, went up to the internet, did a little bit of mashup work, found out you know, what the weather was like, and even gave the date there. It grabbed that metadata and provided it there, because a lot of people like that kind of info. What do hackers use? They use the same thing as what we use, folks. They use all these tools that I was used, but also things like FlexisBuy. FlexisBuy is a very, very nice little application that makes it possible to use your mobile phone to map out an entire network. I think we've all heard of an Nmap. It's been around 20 years. Nmap, network mapper. That's a piker compared to the mapping tools that are available on your mobile phone today. Uh, for discovery, there's BT crawler. That's Bluetooth crawler. There's Blue Sniff. There's B2B brow BTV browser. All sorts of fancy little applications that are available to good and bad guys alike. The additional tools, Wireshark, of course. There's Spy Bubble. GPS location tracking. My point is, is that this metadata stuff and your mobile phone can be brought together to capture a tremendous amount of information. So how do you protect yourself? First of all, let's start with antivirus. Like, what does antivirus have to do with metadata? Trust me on this. Antivirus applications do more than just stop some sort of virus. Antivirus applications also have the ability to lock down some of the features I'm talking about that generate a tremendous amount of metadata. Encrypt your SD card. If you can, if you can and when you can, encrypt your native memory. Usually only fancy people like CEOs or presidents get the ability to encrypt, strongly encrypt native memory. But that's coming, folks. It's coming more and more. Uh, disable features, G GPS tagging, app-based tagging. Use a passphrase on your phone so that when you lose it at the airport, it's a little more difficult. Security, folks, isn't about absolute security. If you want absolute security, you could do a couple of things. One, you could take your phone, remove the battery from it, and remove, if you can, the actual SIM card, right? Physically remove it, and then just don't use it, right? Okay? Um, if you want to, if you want relative security, it's all about raising the bar to a reasonable level. And good, smart consumers and smart networking people know where that level is between no access and just enough. Use a passcode. Remote data wiping. If you lose your phone, make it possible for your phone so that you can destroy the phone, uh, the phone data. So the person gets a brand new piece of hardware, darn, but can't grab the data. Just make sure that if you have remote data wiping capability that nobody else gets a hold of it. Right? I mean, if I was a bad guy and I wanted to cause a problem for you, I'd wipe your phone for you. Destroy it. Right? Uh, while, you're, while you're traveling. Always a fun thing. Don't forget traditional devices, desktop and notebooks. They still do exist, okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, they uh, work in tandem. Uh, become literate at the tools that you're using. Am I asking you to become a geek? Uh, a little. Know your phone settings. Get under the covers of that phone, under the hood a little bit, and figure out what's going on. Peek underneath the hood and learn about it. So become a smart consumer. Uh, uh, things that you can do, uh, configuring your phones to stop collecting data as much as possible. Uh, you can also get on tracking protection lists, ABIND standard, easy privacy. Um, some people might argue that these companies track people all as well. Um, I think you're getting way into the paranoidville there. They're, they're pretty good uh, organizations. There are add-ons, tracker block for Chrome, uh, you know, for mobile, for mobile phones and for your phone. Uh, Ghostery, those are good tools that you can use. So I, I don't want to scare folks unless I give some sort of way to solve it. Uh, uh, so additional steps. Uh, there's the remove the battery, remove the smart card if you want. Uh, configure, uh, and that's important by the way, not just the battery but the smart card. Why? Because phones do have at times a little bit of power left over and they can still run that SIM card. So you remove the SIM card and then no power can get to it. Uh, opt out as much as possible if you, if you want, and that's what I was talking about with ABINE standard. 
password protection, use good ones. Uh, what is good ones? Find out from your provider. What might work for Verizon or for Samsung might not work for iPhone, folks. You see what I'm trying to say? Find out from your provider what a good password is. Firmware updates. Anybody ever upgraded the firmware on anything before or their phone, right? Do that as often as you can. It's very important. Uh, and even application updates. So you got firmware, the operating system, the applications. Do those kind of updates. More and more companies are aware that if they have a phone that is seen as has a reputation for raising the bar a little bit about metadata leakage or antivirus or security, better encryption, they'll sell more of them. Be careful of default settings, the same as with uh, servers 20 years ago. Uh, it's very important, folks, uh, to take the time to learn. There are manuals available if you need to. There are also teenagers available that know lots about phones. Uh, there are a lot of additional tools out there. There's the uh, N NL NLNZ metadata extraction tool and others. What can you do if you've been hacked? A good hacker gets a hold of your phone and you really won't know it, will you? Right? But some things you can do, first of all, uh, look at your mobile phone provider statements for once, okay? Just to see what kind of usage is going on. Look for signs of parasitic activity. If your battery life suddenly goes down, a couple of reasons why. One, you have an older phone and batteries start to get old and die. But the second reason could be that there is some sort of Trojan, some sort of software running on your phone that's acting parasitically and grabbing data, right? Don't install apps delivered via email or Twitter or whatever. Go up to Google Play, Amazon, or Apple. Tim made a good point that Apple seems to raise the bar just a skosh, just a little bit uh, with their third party. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my point being, though, go and get them through official, thir official uh, delivery sites, not somebody's website, for heaven's sake, or, or illicit things. Um, what do you do if you're hacked? If you're hacked, well, contact a proper individual. This uh, phone happens to be owned really by CompTIA, so I need to contact CompTIA, my organization. Uh, contact your IT department or contact your ISP. Consider resetting your phone or tablet. This is an example of where you can actually destroy. It'll destroy everything. All your pictures, your one-year-old's pictures, or whatever. But if you think you have to start from scratch, why not? So. I've uh, thrown up some useful, uh, put up some uh, useful resources. This PowerPoint should be available. If it's not available or for whatever reason you have any questions to ask of me, and these are tools that I've put together, again, uh, resources that you can go out and learn, learn it for yourself. Um, if you want more resources to learn more, I'll have my uh, URL, uh, my email available for you and my phone number. You can contact me. So we talked about what your mobile device is telling people. Not just about the case that you choose or the color or your provider, but what kind of information is it leaking. Uh, so uh, I've uh, talked just one minute over time into your lunch, so I doubt there would be many questions. Uh, but what questions do you have? Uh, here's a way you can get a hold of me. Uh, feel free to get a hold of me. You can even uh, call me, 360-970-5357. I'd be happy to talk with you. Ah, question, yes. Backup recommendations. Backup recommendations. Um, Symantec has a very good one, believe it or not, for your Android. Uh, for, for, uh, I also like Dropbox's stuff uh, as, as, as options. Uh, I think those are really good ones. Uh, there's also, uh, it slips my mind. Talk to you afterwards. I can't remember. It's a very good provider. But I, I would go uh, with a good cloud type provider, okay? Uh, question in the back that I was ignoring. Nope, okay. Any other questions? So thank you very much, folks. And here's the thing, here's the thing. When it comes to CompTIA, again, we offer certifications. Why? Because we have found in the IT industry, whether it be security, whether it be the help desk worker, you are going to be assessed. You just will, either by a hacker, right, or by your boss, right? Why not start that assessment process earlier? Because we find that learning takes place much better once you know that a good formal assessment comes afterwards. So there's my pitch. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Uh, enjoy lunch. And I'll be right outside. Have a good one. Thank you, James. We're going to go ahead and uh, break for lunch and reconvene back at 1230.